Amen. We're coming into the to the house of the Lord uh, in worship. Um, I appreciate uh, well, I appreciate both our pianists uh, over over time. Recently, Kathy's been playing a lot. We appreciate the uh, all of them uh, playing for our singing as well as playing. Uh, for these uh, preludes and such to prepare us as we come. Let me mention a couple of uh, things in uh, terms of announcements. Uh, you will see um, there are, uh, our groups will meet this week. I don't think there's anything to hinder that. I believe the, uh, our men will return. We uh, took, took a day off on Friday, so we'll return on Friday morning uh, for prayer. And uh, the women's Tuesday group, I think, um, uh, I, I don't know how... And how uh, Nancy will be able to maneuver around, or if she's going to be able to get out. I think she's getting close to, to being able to do more. Bill might be able to give you an update if you're interested. Um, and I'll, I'll check on it. I knew that uh, earlier in the week she said, uh, Toes, oh, I got to get this straight, uh, Marcia. Toes over nose for about 11 more days. So I had to keep her foot elevated. And, uh, but we'll pray that she, I said, uh, we'll pray that you can endure your exile. And uh, make it uh, uh, make it through that, and then be able to hopefully return to more well, I'll say normal functioning, but be able to get around a little more. But I think the Tuesday group is going to continue, uh, and of course the Wednesday group. You all are going to do a new book soon, right? Is it starting maybe a couple of weeks or this coming week? A week from Wednesday. A week from Wednesday. So uh, it's called the Heart uh, Hearts of Fire. Hearts of Fire. Um, I know they uh, have that usually promoted regularly with uh, some of the groups about uh, missions and some of the challenges, um, the stories of various women in, in, in missions. So uh, talk to Barb if you want that book, want to read it, whether you can meet or not with them, you can uh, enjoy interacting or maybe sharing some emails about it. Um, let me uh, also remind you, uh, Meryl Ekstrom, who's uh, doing the cancer treatment, she's, she's going to have a surgery on Tuesday. So be in prayer for Maryland. Um, it's, it's coming. Uh, we're approaching rapidly, approaching, uh, and pray the benefits of this as well as obviously uh, getting through it well. So pray, pray for her. And um, let me mention. I mentioned this the adult class. Uh, you may see a, a pretty uh, tragic a story being reported right now in the news uh, in McMinn County. Yesterday morning, there was uh, basically a um, very violent act that ended up. Um, with four, four people killed, and uh, essentially all of them relatively young. Um, uh, one of those uh, deaths was a, a relative of, uh, it's, it's actually Lisa's um, brother-in-law's <coughs> youngest sister. So one of her sisters, um, her, her husband is, uh, it, it, and it's very heavy. So there's a, that, that has, if you see that, WBR or any of the, any of the local news stations will be probably reporting on that. Um, know that there's somebody we are very close with who's deeply affected by it. And there's obviously a lot of people affected by this. Uh, we also, uh, she also has a, a sister as well that she shared about, would like for your prayer for her as well, um, in, in terms of some issues, um, there. So, um, just our broader family, Lisa's broader family in particular, and specifically her sister, uh, if you would pray for her. Um, you can get more details uh, uh, from her or me directly. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, be in prayer for those things. Um, keep an eye, I think, uh, well, last week we updated the September prayer list. I think there's copies back there, maybe some in there if you want to get a hold of it. We have a lot of people who uh, we are praying for. We're seeing God uh, uh, pour out blessings upon their lives. However, there's other needs that are ongoing, so continue to lift those up. Um, let us uh, take just a minute to, uh, to uh, in, in prayer and meditation, prepare our hearts as we come before the Lord this morning.
for call to worship this morning. I'm going to read a verse that you're going to hear again in the reading of the word before the sermon. And uh, because it is a very appropriate um, use of, of this, uh, of that text. In Colossians 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. In a place, um, as I've mentioned, in a, in a place in Paul's epistle where there's, uh, he's shifted to some very practical teachings, uh, there's one that very much touches on our, our behavior with one another together in the body of Christ uh, that we teach and admonish for our edification and we also with thanksgiving in our hearts sing to God of his grace in Jesus Christ. So let us come to worship today together with one another to perform uh, what that verse teaches. How about we stand together, sing our praise, 642. I know several of you really enjoy this hymn and appreciate a great deal. Be Thou My Vision, 642. Let's stand together. This day before you in humble faith, approaching you, knowing that we have nothing in and of ourselves, uh, deserving your acceptance, but we come only as those who've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And we only come because you've permitted and allowed us to, that Christ has torn open the curtain to allow the access directly into the presence of God. And we come made fit by his righteousness and in obedience to your command that calls us to 
come boldly to the throne of grace. So we come today asking that you would come among us and by the presence of your spirit, you would help us to worship well, to worship you in spirit and truth in a manner that's fitting the sovereign Lord over all heaven and earth and our covenant Lord in Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll feed us from your word and you will feed our souls as we come to the table this day. But we come and are praising you and asking your presence and your help and worship in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the back of the hymnal is the Nicene Creed. It's our custom to use this on the day in which we come to the table, and uh, certainly an appropriate one, uh, as I've mentioned and pointed out various times, is that long middle section. You kind of wonder if we're ever going to get through it. But there's a reason for that. This uh, creed was put together at a time when there were many denying, denying the full divinity of Christ. And so, as the church met, they put together these statements that if those people could not utter these words, then their own, their own uh, lack of confession, uh, what was missing, condemned them. They weren't accepting Christ for who he really was. And it's appropriate that we have that kind of focus on the day we come to the table where our attention is drawn to the redeeming purposes and, and the, uh, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. So, with that in mind, let me just uh, ask, Christian, what is it that you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under conscious power. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, and let's turn to Psalm 27, page 792, and I hope I got that correct. I think I did. 792 in the hymnal, Psalm 27. I think a, uh, a good psalm to read, uh, partly for communion, partly just to uh, understand the... Uh, our relationship and the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and our membership and being part of his family. Um, let's read responsibly Psalm 27. I'll read the light print. You respond with the bold. Pay attention. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though the war break out against me, even then will I be confident. 
One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I see. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to see him in his name. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, and set me high upon the rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And this tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says to you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppression. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. May the Lord add his blessings to reading. Uh, the understanding, the application of this. Um, you probably see hints there of, um, of a messianic uh, reality there at the end uh, where uh, the foes and the witnesses gather around breathing out violence. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, experienced that. Uh, but I think for all God's people, as we face those things, we can find shelter, protection, and care. And then we always have this hope. We have this confidence that we will, in fact, see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I think we see something of that now in our, in our living among the family of God, but also the hope of glory. Um, because we serve a living Lord, when we're called out of this world, this life, we go to the land of the living, not of the dead. So let's encourage one another with that truth regularly. Uh, what... Uh, what I want to do is, is, is offer an, an exclamation, not an exclamation, an exclamation. Um, I don't know, I probably put it in the wrong place, but there is an exclamation mark in this hymn title to, to uh, assert it and assert it with great energy. Redeemed, how I love to, I hate that uh, Virginia didn't make it today. I know that this was Byron Blanchard's favorite hymn. And I know she always appreciates when we sing it. And uh, I don't know, I may visit her this week and just sing it for her. Uh, that Hopefully that wouldn't ruin it. Uh, but it, but uh, uh, this is a uh, certainly <coughs> the um, exclaiming of our redemption in Christ and how beautiful it is to us. How about we do this? Let's stand as we sing. You can't exclaim anything sitting down. So let's stand up and let's sing. Redeemed, how I love for God. 701. <laughs>
seated. If I happen to hear some of you singing that refrain to yourself while you're taking communion today, I will join with a hearty amen because uh, uh, the, that's, I don't know, just the joy uh, of that to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb certainly is the focus that the, uh, our attention should be drawn to the sacrifice of Christ when we come to the supper. Uh, and then, of course, the joy and excitement of knowing His sacrifice blesses and benefits us in the way it is. And what's neat is it's, uh, you know, what he endured was one of the one of the awfulest. I don't know if that's the way you're supposed to say that. But it sounds like it, sounds like it just has more force than if it's most awful. Uh, the awfulest thing in all history, it is the um, worst uh, injustice Of all. And yet, it is pictured for us in a beautiful meal in which we get to eat and drink in order to appropriate and proclaim and receive and be nourished in that truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we, uh, we are grateful. Uh, your word, especially as we've been going through it in Colossians, repeatedly has told us to be thankful, that in thanksgiving and continually being thankful with thankfulness in our heart to reflect on and to share these truths of your grace that is found in Jesus Christ. Lord, to, to be thankful promotes in us the recognition that we are recipients of grace, that we are those who've been given so much in Christ Jesus. Not only the benefits of his death for us, but the benefits of his life are for us as well. There are the legal benefits of being pardoned and being established in your family, but there are also the real benefits of life, the spirit living in us, working righteousness in us, growing us in grace and knowledge. And there's the hope of life eternal, one day, we will be made like our Savior in every way, glorified with Him. We long for that. We pray that that hope and that truth, we can, we can exemplify that in our living and we can hold it out in the face of death. Or it just seems like there's been several examples of very tragic death. Some we've recorded this morning, others we've known of earlier in this week that has rocked our community, especially younger people. This shakes us up. It reveals the worst of what this fallen condition, the fallen and broken world marred by sin produces. How thankful we are that the Lord Jesus Christ came to overcome all of that. We pray that the gospel, the good news, all of its truth, all of its blessings may be held out and held up to a world that is dying in sin. The darkness of sin is overwhelming. It seems to be having its way in so many places. Lord, our world needs Christ. We call on you. We ask you to move powerfully by your spirit to bring a spiritual awakening that results in a great revival in our community, in this land, across the globe. We ask you to move where we see so many things that are against what you've revealed. We sadly witness so many things that are the fruit of sin. And we want to see the fruit of righteousness. We want to see the rule and the reign of God. We want to see the blessings of Christ poured out on our community and on families and on individuals to restore them, and to, that they may share in the joy and in the goodness that you have for your people. 
that they may have hope, especially in a world and a society that seems to be so hopeless. Lord, shed the light of your grace, shed the light of your truth on us, we pray. Lord, we in this church family, we need you as well. We have a number of people, even among our church family or those we care about who need you. They need your presence. They need your healing. They need your encouragement of heart. And they need the presence of the Spirit to sustain them in faith. We have those going through the cancer treatments and um, that saps them of physical and emotional energy and certainly brings with it an obstacle to their spiritual lives and their faith. So we would pray for them. We pray that you sustain them, that while they are weak, they will be made strong in Christ. We pray for Marilyn. She has her surgery in a couple of days, that you would bring her through that well, that, it, that you would bless her with the benefits of this procedure and that you would sustain her by your grace and strength through it all. Bless their family by blessing her. Um, renew them all through the renewal and the healing that you grant to her. We um, pray your continued care over all those that we're praying for dealing with cancer. Some um, of our family members uh, that have been, have been mentioned, we would pray you care for them. We pray for those who are grieving because of recent loss of loved ones and the anxiety, the fear, the terror that, that death brings, the sadness that it um, brings. We would pray for that peace from the Holy Spirit and the comforting ministry that only you can grant. So provide that to those who hurt and who grieve. We, um, we want to pray particularly about the problems that result from the various drug uh, addictions and dependence and all of the conflict that results in the, in, the, in the culture that surrounds all of that. We want to pray that you would restrain that evil. Even for those who for a time will still be in bondage, we pray that you would, you would protect and prevent them. But then we would pray that you bring your grace. Help us who know people to have wisdom to share the right things and to offer the right help. Prevent us from enabling, but also grant us grace to be compassionate and to reach out in ways we can. And Lord, use our meager attempts, but also in your great power, intervene, change hearts, deliver them from the bondage and bring them to yourself. Lord, we would pray that that would be one of the fruits of this revival we're praying for, that those who are enslaved to substance dependence will be released and their lives will be transformed. They may enjoy the blessings of God and learn that the joy of being indwelt by the Holy Spirit is so much better than the temporary euphoria of some chemical introduced to the body. Help us to also rejoice in the Lord daily. Hear our prayer. Answer our prayer according to your good will. And renew us your people for your name's sake. For we come and lift up our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As the ushers now to come as we worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Let's stand for the doxology. this portion of what you've entrusted to us. And we ask that you accept it and bless it for your name's sake. Make our ministry effective in this place, but also our ministry to contribute to the great commission here and around the world. For we come and make our offering of prayer. In Jesus' name, we taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and turn to Colossians 3. I'm going to turn to chapter, uh, verses 12 through 17 today, the next section. Our spiritual apparel in Christ. There are probably even more clever ways to say it, but you'll see what I'm getting at when we start reading. Last week, we looked at the section just prior. It's about the putting to death the things of the earthly nature. And now we turn to more, a more positive teaching, meaning not, um, the, I mean, the other teaching is good for us, it's positive in that sense, but it's a negative, to put to death or to put away. And then there is the, um, t today is the more, the, is the um, alternate, the flip side um, to put on something. So verse 12 through 17, verses 12 through 17, give attention here, Colossians 3. Be in verse 12. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Some of your translations say put on them. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, or maybe meekness is the translation. Gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love. It's agape love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen, amen. May the Lord bless the reading and the understanding and the application of his holy word this day. I remember, I, I guess I'm trying to think of how old I would have been, but I probably didn't know all the details, but I still don't know, but I, do you remember the... Uh, that program, that public push that I think it was Nancy Reagan as uh, First Lady had. Just say no. Just say no. And it was all about the drug problem. The just say no. You just see bumper stickers. And uh, I think I remember probably some things at school where there were programs and presentations. The just say no attempt. And, and I, 
I don't know how to assess whether that had any benefits or not, but it seemed to be kind of viewed as a positive thing. You know, as is the case with all first ladies, there's usually some kind of a thing, some kind of a public uh, beneficial focus that they try to bring and share. However, there's a, there's a thing about that. Um, often, to simply address the negative as we relate to our human uh, responses and behavior, we'll miss um, something to just say no. I remember once, um, well, there's various things. There's probably several stories I could tell about this, but I discovered once, I remember um, our little church we helped out with in Mississippi as a student assistant while I was in seminary. Um, I, I wasn't considered a youth master. I was considered just to be a student assistant. I taught a young adult you know, Sunday school and would fill in for the pastor and try to do a, broadly various things. But one of the things was to be involved with the young people. And I remember one night um, in, in, in the back of their sanctuary, sort of like here, there were two doors going out. Immediately you have several stairs that it drops down. And as you can imagine, some of our young children would enjoy uh, getting on those stairs and doing what? Jumping off of them, you know? But as you know, that's, uh, that's behavior un, uh, you know, un, uh, not fitting for the house of the Lord, whether it's in the sanctuary or not. So often we were having to deal with that, and I remembered one night seeing kids doing that, and I thought, well, i got to go tell them to stop. But I had kind of learned that one of, the, one of the best ways to deal, especially with kind of rambunctious boys, was not just to say, hey, hey you, you can't be doing that, but to rather offer them an alternative. Fill in the negative to can't do this with something else. To give them a focus, give them another place where they can appropriate do it. And it seemed to, seemed to work most of the time. So I said, hey, uh, guys, why don't we not jump off these stairs? Why don't you go right out there and jump off those stairs? Now, it was dangerous, but it worked. You know, they, oh, okay, go ahead. There's stairs out here. And nobody knew that they were out there jumping off the side stairs outside because they were doing it. The negative is important. There's obviously many things about the Christian faith. God has revealed many things to us in a negative form. A thou shalt not. Such as the Ten Commandments. By, by the way, not all of them are thou shalt not. Some of them are actually phrased in the positive. However, throughout all of his revelation, there's also a balanced teaching or revealed truth about what ought to be the focus I think it's one of the reasons why, not only this passage here, but throughout Paul's epistles, there are, you can re, kind of read the parallel in Ephesians 4 and 5. And there's a lot of teaching about the put this away and put and do this. There's not only the don't do, but there's here, do this, focus on this, and turn your attention to this. One of the reasons why I think the reformers realized that in teaching the law of God, it had to be more than just simply articulating the negative, the thou shalt not portion, the prohibitions, and said to understand the, the, um, the law correctly and for us to benefit as New Testament Christians from the laws to understand the fuller intent and as also to understand what those positive um, uh, requirements are of the law. So when you read through the catechisms, smaller or larger, you're going to see the balance. What does this commandment prohibit? And what does this commandment require? In addition to that, I think also the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus taught the antitheses that you have heard it said. And basically he was identifying the very limited understanding of the law that was especially taught by the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, what I tell you, and then he gave it his fuller meaning. And that, that meaning that it wasn't re, uh, restricted just to behavior and conduct, but also in incorporated the mind and the heart and the motives and the intentions of the heart. So here we are in a section in the New Testament. We last week looked at the put to death these things, but then right after that, we're told, put on this, put on these things. There's not just the don't just say no. There's also, here's what you're to say yes to. Here's where you can turn your mind. Remember just a few weeks ago we said to set our heart. This is chapter 3, the hinge, turning to the practical applications. So it set your heart and as it set your mind, if we turn our mind to these things, 
it will help us to set our full heart, our whole being on the heavenly things and away from those things that he taught us, told us to put to death or to put off. In Ephesians, he said, put off. So I'm calling it the spiritual apparel because that's exactly what's in view here. The language is suggesting the taking off of some things and the putting on of others. The NIV translated it, clothe yourselves. But some of you have translated it, put on compassion or mercy. Put on humility or meekness. Put on. See, there is, we are supposed to be um, outfitted, draped, clothed in certain things as a product and as a fruit of our being united to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And that's what he's turning his attention to. Okay, so let me, what it, three, three sections, I guess a fourth. What are we to put on? Um, and then, what is to rule us? And what is to dwell in us? And then, in a summarizing fashion, well, whatever you do. Whatever you do. Those are the four things. Let me quickly get through. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. What are we supposed to clothe ourselves with? You'll see that this is a shorter version. I mean, I mean not that much shorter. It almost covers every one of them of the Galatians list of fruit of the Spirit. And you notice I said fruits, not fruits. People have pointed out there that this is a fruit, singular, of the Spirit. And then it lists all these things. Now, in Galatians, it started with what? The fruit of the Spirit is love, agape. I think it was moved to that preeminent place because of its significance. Uh, here, he ended with it, but he ended with it and then highlighted the significance of it in terms of saying what? And also, then put on love over all these, verse 14, put on Love, agape, self-sacrificing, self, um, you know, selfless love, active love. It's primarily about the other and not about self. Overall, he's put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we're not talking about discrete, different things. We're, again, as Galatians speaks about the fruit, singular, and then lists all these things, they kind of all are together. We're not supposed to say, well, I can exemplify those, but I'm not sure about those other ones. No, all of it is a product of our union with Christ. All of it is the fruit of his union. And this is what we are to turn our attention to, to put on as clothing. In sections like this in scripture, here's actually an assessment tool of our Christian life. We can read these and then go, okay, so how now do I, how, do I or do I not, how well or how deficient am I in exemplifying these? In other words, am I clothing myself? Am I wearing this spiritual apparel? It gives us a chance to do that. Well, what is it? I told you about love. It's agape love, selfless love. It's the thing that binds it all together. Really what's, what's in view is agape love can show up in a lot of different ways. Selfless, self-sacrificing love can show up in many ways. Well, what are some of the ways? Well, one of them is compassion or mercy. What is compassion? What, what distinguishes it from anything else we might say? Well, it's looking upon the weakness, the inability, or the suffering of another and being moved to enter into it with them. Okay, we sometimes use the word pity. You see, pity is more like standing at a distance and going, oh, bless his heart. Compassion or mercy is saying bless his heart and then rolling up your sleeves and entering into it. What else? Kindness. Okay, this is the uh, this is probably the other side. The compassion that enters into because of mercy or realizing the helplessness or the inadequacy or the pitiful state, the pitiable state of someone, the suffering of someone else, is the goodness that's offered. It's doing something positive, that is goodness. That is the sharing of goodness to others. That's what kindness or goodness is. Humility or meekness. 
It's recognizing and being content living in that humble and lowly state. I mentioned to the class we were talking about what does the phrase little children mean in the New Testament as we were studying it. And it's, it's basically this. It's a metaphorical way of saying those who uh, remain uh, content and faithful and committed in this lowly state. It's a, it's a state in which you do not feel the compulsion to assert your own position or status or to assert yourself to climb up to a higher status or position. That's why it has nothing to do with weakness. Okay? I always say that. Meekness is not weakness. It's not, it's not being a punching bag or, a, you know, or for someone or, or, or some situation. It's just simply recognizing a lowly place and being content with that and remaining faithful and obedient to God in it. That is his end. And by the way, this is one. Uh, others, you'll see. Most commentators will point out that this was this was a um, definitely in the kind of the Greek culture that persisted, and, and even under Roman rule, that this would have been like this would have been um, really strange to say that because these these things were not considered to be virtues; they would have been considered something. And I would contend that humility or meekness is also something that would be viewed by our predominant culture as something undesirable. Who, who do we value most? Who do we hold up in high regard? Who do we love? Who do we consider to be, quote, dynamic leaders? Often it's those people who are outspoken, who put themselves out there, who love being up front, who love the attention for themselves. They love being known as that sort of thing. In other words, right, the opposite. And in Christian living, Christian faithfulness, a fruit of this, to put on the garments of Christ is, is, to, is to take on the garment of meekness and, and humility. Gentleness would also be uh, kind of with that. It would not, would not have been viewed, it would not have been viewed as a virtue in, in the biblical world, but also even in ours. Gentleness. But you know what? If you reflect on it, I, it the gentleness is this, is this sort of like, um, humility in action when somebody deals with you in such a way that's very tender and you know it when you see it. Of course, then it also goes into patience. And by the way, you'll notice all of these are known for what they are because they're, they're virtues not in a vacuum or, like I said, these are virtues that are known in our relationships with one another. All of them. I mean, how... I, you know, this gentleness is not gentleness because somebody just, oh, they're quiet, reserved, and they just go keep to themselves. <laughs> I guess you could call that gentleness, but that's not what it's talking Gentleness as they relate to others. And then, of course, uh, it moves on into the patience. The patience is to, is to be able to bear with things that are kind of against you or, uh, uh, you know, that is, that is difficult for you that other people bring to bear with it. And it's, it mentions that. The long, long suffering is another word for it. Bear with each other. And then, of course, forgiving whatever grievances you may have. Forgiveness. But all of these, all of these are really a, a, a specific manifestation of agape love. Self-sacrifice. <coughs> selfless love. See? Because when you forgive, you have a reason. But you choose not to hold back against that's what forgiveness is. Um, all of those. There's an element, you know, compassion. Compassion implies that you, you, you put yourself at a disadvantage or you put yourself through trouble in order to help somebody else who is disadvantaged. You enter into that with them. All that. That's, it's an expressive agape love. Those are the clothes those are the, that's the spiritual peril that we are to focus on putting on. So like the person who realizes, well, I'll tell you what, I struggle with compassion. That doesn't give you the right to ignore it. That's the very area where God would be at work to try to make, you know, grow you in your faith. Well, I know I'm supposed to have compassion, but I'll tell you what, those people there, they're doing that. I just can't have any compassion on that. That's the very place where when you read this, your heart ought to be convinced that, well, this is where I'm going to have to depend on the Lord more because he wants me to put that on. He's not giving us, 
He's not giving us wiggle room so, well, I'll pick this and I'll take that and choose. No, he's saying, put on these things. And agape love, these expressions, wrap them all together in unity. They're all to be part of our Christian lives. We should be praying regularly. Every day, the Lord would help us put on these things. Because you know, you know what? Uh, they exemplify, you know who exemplified all these the most? Jesus himself. I mean, on a few occasions here in this context, it would say things like, since you have died with Christ, since you've been raised with him in them, see? And often we think about, though, that kind of a union with Christ in terms of our redemption. You know, today it's going to be highlighted in the song. But it's almost like this, okay? If you want to be united to Christ and receive the benefits of your salvation in him, you also have to understand by being united to him, there's also the expectation that you're clothed in him in your daily Christian living. So put on these garments. Christ is your righteousness as you come to him in faith that gets you right with God. That's justification. Christ is working in you for your holiness and sanctification. And part of that sanctification is that he is moving you to more and more clothe yourselves in these ways. That's Christian living at work in reality. We need to be praying earnestly. The Lord will help us overcome those things that we are not naturally bent toward, overcome those sinful ways to be the opposite of this, and be praying earnestly that he will enable us to put these things on, because in that we will be doing what he wants in our lives. Now, let me move on. There's two other, uh, try to hit these more uh, quickly. Okay, so put on Christ, basically, by putting on the clothing that resembles and, and uh, the virtues that he imparts to us in our union with him. Now, let the peace of Christ rule. That's what's to rule. It's kind of an unusual statement here because we usually we say, you know, we no longer are ruled by a sinful impulse or nature. Christ rules. To say let the peace rule is, sort of, is a little weird. I think really what it's saying is, it's saying let Christ rule in your heart and, and, and allow that peace that he imparts to be uh, a reality. Let the peace of Christ rule. What is this? Is this peace in the terms of an objective um, peace that we all have? We've been, our peace has been made between us and God through Christ. Peace has made, been made between us and other believers, and it's even been made between us and the rest of the world to some degree. We're longing for that peace to be brought in its fullness, that great shalom uh, in the glory, but that. But here it's saying that the peace of Christ rule in your heart. So I think especially here, it's pointing out that this that to appropriate peace in your experience, that it's experiential peace. But notice how it says it, to let it rule. It's not saying, okay, this, this is easy to, it's easy to kind of move to this direction and say, you know, you're a Christian. Jesus has died for your sins. He's going to take you to heaven one day. He's at work in you, making you more and more Christ-like. Now, you should be, you should have peace in your life. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the guilty application of the benefits and the peace that we have. Rather, it's the same. To say it this way implies we can or may or may not have the peace ruling in our experience at times. But it's encouraging us to let it have, you know, let experience peace. Peace has been won. Christ has done everything. Now let it be your experience. Not shame on you. You don't have peace. You're always worried about stuff. But rather... Let the experience it, it's yours to have. Let it be there. And of course, that experience of peace then will work its way out as the virtue in our peaceful, loving relationship, especially with other believers in the church, but even with all. So let the peace rule. You were called to peace and be thankful. What's odd is that that thankful is added to the end of this, to be thankful. Again, when we're told to be thankful, it's simply to acknowledge that stuff has been done for you. To be thankful for something is that something has been done for you. Well, everything that we've been given in Christ is cause of thanksgiving, and therefore then that will help prompt us then to allow the peace to 
a rule. Enjoy it. Let the peace of Christ be yours. Even in the midst of chaotic circumstances and uncertainties and anxieties, let the peace of Christ be yours. And let that then be shared with others in the church. Now, the other part is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, you probably can pick up on this. As the word of Christ, why does it say the word of Christ rather than the word of God? It's probably because the word of God that is known in Christ, in other words, the gospel. Or it could mean sort of the specific things that Christ taught himself as part of the revealing of God's truth. It, it, I mean, it, Either way you want to specify it, it's, it's just this. It's the things of Christ. The, the Word, uh, the Word of God that makes Christ known to us. It should dwell in us. Um, there's other times I've preached that the Spirit is to dwell in our hearts. Well, when the Spirit dwells in our hearts, then the Word is going to dwell too. Because that the Spirit is going to be reminding us and teaching us of the Word. The Word of God. And the Word of about Christ is the Word directed to Him. So let that dwell in you. That's why we put so much, why half the service is devoted to the preaching of the word. Why we want to preach and study. Why? So that we may teach and admonish one another. Teach and admonish that this is, part, this is the, the primary function of the church is that we are taught and led the word to, in order that the word may dwell within us. But then that's not all. As the word is dwelling in us, it also kind of leads to and prompts a, a response of celebration and rejoicing. So the word dwelling, bringing, teaching, and admonishing then naturally leads to our expressions to God in joyous thanks and celebration. Um, the way this is usually translated is often uh, hard to sell. Is this saying to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? By the way, uh, I'm not going to get into a big debate over what all those mean specifically. It's just simply, there's a variety of, of words of expression in music that we can use. Is it to speak to one another this way in order to do that? Or is this speaking to God? Because it ends with, with gratitude in your hearts to God. I think this, primarily this is our expression to God. Our love uh, language toward God is uh, often set to music. Why? Because music is a, is a beautiful way of expressing it. It communicates it, it, it communicates the depth and the richness and the beauty of it. If we just read those words, it would be even less, you know, but we sing them to show our true love and gratitude to God. Now, the summarizing thing, and I'll use this as my conclusion as we come to the table. So put on these things. Uh, let the peace rule, okay? Christ rule in your heart. And let the word dwell in your hearts. The word of Christ. Those three. And then in case you just didn't quite, quite get it all, he ends with this. Well, really, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And now we could go into the whole thing. What does it mean? I would say, I would say probably the best understanding of this is that as those who are united to the Lord Jesus Christ, anything you do is to be prompted and led by him, and you're doing it is you're doing it as one who is united to him and representing him. Yeah, you're doing it because he tells you to. You're doing it in his guidance, and you're doing it because he's authority over your life. But it's it's your it's your union with him prompts you to act. In in essence, you're an ambassador wherever you go. Whatever you're doing. You are clothed in his righteousness. You are putting on the garments of Christ. And when you're doing it, you're doing it as him for those you're doing it for. I've heard it once said that anything Christians do, we do this particular thing, but we're cleverly disguised uh, in that. But really, we're a disciple of Christ. So I, I'm a um, concrete Worker, I lay concrete and foundations for buildings. I'm cleverly disguised as a concrete worker, but I'm truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, cleverly disguised as an attorney. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, cleverly disguised 
as an administrative worker for a community college. I, or a teacher at a community college, let me get two of them there. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, an ambassador of his, cleverly disguised as a school teacher or administrator of schools. I am a disciple and an ambassador of Christ, cleverly disguised as a laborer in a manufacturing plant. See that? Whatever you do, in word or deed, clothed in his righteousness, united to him, do it all in his name. That is, he is in you and you are doing it in him as an ambassador, as a representative. What would happen if God's people everywhere, if that was widely the way in which we did it and the impact it had? What a missionary force that would be. Every believer, whatever we do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let us pray that the Lord will enable us and equip us to do that. Let's come to the table. I'll ask the elders to come prepare the table as, as we uh, celebrate this union we have with Christ as we come to feed on him in the supper.
and feed on him <coughs> and rejoice in thanksgiving for what he's done for you. That's right. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful meal that you left us that signifies your death for us. And we pray now that we set apart the bread and juice for its holy use. And as we partake of faith, feed our souls. Nourish our faith. And promote in us, and cultivate in us the virtues that we just read about in your word. Be at work in us, Christ. Holy Spirit, make Christ alive in us. That whatever we do, in word or deed, we can do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come and pray and pray in faith and through Christ's own Lord. Amen. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took that bread and broke it. And he told them, he said, this is my body given to you. I can drink all of you. And after the supper, he took the cup. After giving thanks, he said, this cup is in the covenant in my blood. <coughs> Shed for me for, for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. All of you. All that day. Distribute and we'll take together. Cup, do so with thanksgiving in your heart. The Lord Jesus shed his blood for you.
I do this. How do you do it? Just a second, I'm sorry. I'm waiting at the elders. <laughs> Let me say it again. The blood of Christ. Drink with thanks to you. Lord, how we are thankful. To be more thankful because every day we realize that we've been given an indescribable gift. That we are children of the Most High God through faith in Jesus Christ. We have all the rights and privileges of your children. We have your abiding love always with us. We're dearly beloved. The text we read this morning tells us we're dearly loved by our Father. Carry us on by your grace. Lead us out of this place to live lives worthy of the Lord Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. And whatever we do, we will honor you in our life. We put this up and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 648, my Jesus, I love thee. Um, kind of carry it. Well, let's do uh, the first verse song. 648. Thank you.